This is Science Friday. I'm Umair Irfan. As the globe has heated up, the polar regions of the Arctic and Antarctica have become the fastest warming places on the planet. Melting sea ice, cracking ice shelves, and retreating glaciers are shaping and reshaping the oceans and contributing to sea level rise along shorelines around the world. Just this year, we've seen some pretty dramatic news. Heat waves at both poles, a shattered ice shelf for the first time in eastern Antarctica, and last summer, rain fell for the first time at the summit in Greenland. Over the last 20 years, the Arctic has lost about one third of its winter sea ice volume. Antarctica, on the other hand, has seen an increase over the decades, even as researchers watch fracturing ice shelves with bated breath. Before the grim news overwhelms all of us, we wanted to sit down with some experts who study the poles. We wanted to talk about what's happening with the ice, what these regions have been changing, and what is complicating our understanding of these regions. And we are here to answer some of your questions about the Arctic and Antarctica with our guests. First, Dr. Uma Bhatt is an atmospheric scientist at the University of Alaska Fairbanks studying the Arctic. Welcome, Uma. And Dr. Oscar Schofield is a biological oceanographer at Rutgers University. He's been working off the west coast of Antarctica for the last several decades. Hello and welcome to both of you to Science Friday. Thanks Thank for you having very me. Much. Uh, I guess we'll start with you, Uma. You've been working as an atmospheric scientist in the Arctic. What are some of the mysteries you've been trying to solve in your research? So my research is in the area of climate variability. So I have been applying climate understanding to understanding how tundra vegetation has changed and how wildland fire is, is, has changed due to climate change. And Oscar, you've been studying the oceans off of West Antarctica for 30 years now. What have you been doing there all this time? So uh, I work on the West Antarctic Peninsula, just south of South America. And that is one of the fastest winter warming places on the planet. So we're studying when you melt the ice, how does that ripple through the food web from the plankton to the penguins? And um, I guess I would start with you, Oscar, then. Um, can you describe some of the changes that we've been seeing um, as it relates to climate change? And what else is happening beyond the visible stuff of melting ice sheets and, and you know, retreating glaciers? Yeah, so th the big thing we're seeing in certain areas around Antarctica is real significant declines in glaciers, um, retreats, and also declines in the sea ice, how much you get every single year. And that essentially structures the physics and chemistry for that part of the planet. And now we're seeing it ripple through a lot of the organisms that live there. So you change how much the plants grow, how well um, the penguins breed year to year. Um, and we're seeing really large differences at Palmer Station. We used to have 1600 breeding pairs of penguins and we're down to about 500. That sounds pretty substantial. Uh, Uma, same question. Uh, what are some of the changes we've seen already and what are we missing in the popular conversation? So overall, the temperatures have increased by almost six degrees since the 60s, and that has caused a decline in sea ice, as you mentioned. So not just a decline in sea ice area, but also sea ice volume. Sea ice has different thicknesses. And that impact of sea ice has many cascading impacts on the climate system. For example, the tundra has greened. There is increased coastal erosion because there's less sea ice. And the, in, in general, the warming of the Arctic has led to a, dec a decline in permafrost, and that has implications to human infrastructure and a, a variety of other cascading impacts. And kind of last item I'll mention is, because the sea ice has declined, that's led to increased ship traffic in the Arctic, which has a whole host of other issues associated with it. Mm -hmm. And we have two experts here from opposite ends of the world. And I think it's a lot pretty easy for people to assume that the Arctic and Antarctica are mirror images of each other because they're both cold and icy, but they're not the same. Can you tell us a little bit about what makes the Arctic different from Antarctica? And I guess I'll start with you, Uma. So I, I'll give my, the answer I give my students as a starting point 
Antarctica is land surrounded by ocean. The Arctic is an ocean surrounded by land. But the ice in the Arctic is already on the ocean. And the, and the ice on the Antarctic is on land. And I'll let Oscar talk more about that. And I think one of the other fundamental differences is the ocean interaction is very different with the global ocean in the Antarctic. In the Arctic, there really are connections only through the Bering Strait and through the North, Pacific, North Atlantic, whereas that's very different in Antarctica. And the final item is in the Arctic, we have uh, permanent settlements and people that are well connected through a variety of different networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sort of building, I mean, Uma described it really well. You know, the Antarctic is the only continent that's surrounded by an ocean, the circumpolar ocean. Um, that is one of the largest current systems on the planet, and it tends to isolate that landmass. Um, that deep ocean current is really warm by Antarctic standards. It's three to four degrees Celsius. And the areas that are melting is where that current is getting pushed close to the continent by a lot of changes in the atmospheric forcing that UMA studies. Mm -hmm. And then sort of the opposite question, then what do the Arctic and Antarctic have in common? Like what are some of the lessons or changes we're seeing in both areas at the same time? I guess I'll let, uh, go ahead, Oscar. <laughs> okay, I mean, I, I think one thing we're seeing, which you kind of see globally, is the seasonality of the whole system is changing. So sea ice season um, around Antarctica has been generally getting shorter. So in the region where I work, it's declined by almost 60 days a year. So if you think of it in terms of winter, you don't have sea ice for half the winter that you used to. And that has a huge impact on the system as a whole. So, so I was just gonna add, and land ice, both in both places, land yeah. ice is, is yeah. going away. So I've been following the news a little bit about the Arctic and Antarctic recently, and I've uh, seen that there's been major wildfires in Siberia, some, some of them north of the Arctic Circle. And we've seen that in previous summers as well. Not really a region that we associate with wildfires, but uh, Uma, can you tell us a little bit about like how unusual this is? And is this part of a broader pattern? So wildfire is a natural part of the boreal system, but over the last several decades, the incidence of large acres burnt has increased in North America, as well as Siberia. So. The, the general conclusion is that we're getting warmer, drier summers, and it doesn't take much for fires to start because it's a very it's a continental climate, so it's very dry to begin with. And, and so, then, is it fair to attribute this or some element of this to climate change? How how does that factor in? So typically when we do attribution studies, we look at a particular case. And there have been several that I've been part of in Alaska, which has asked, is this due to climate change? And so the 2015 fire season was the second highest in Alaska and that we were able to conclude that it was much more likely because of climate change. And there was a similar study that we did in 2019 that showed something similar for a region. So typically when you do these attribution studies, you do it very regionally and focused. And I have not done them for Russia, so, but. I, so would it be fair to presume that if average temperatures continue to rise, we'll see more of this, more fires in the Arctic and polar regions, or is there gonna be some sort of tipping point or other kinds of factors here? So when we use climate models to project what's going to happen in the future, we do see the incidence of these fires bigger, longer fire seasons increasing. So certainly all the data and our analysis suggests that that is something we, we do need to be prepared for. Okay. We have an audience question from Earl from Davis, California for Oscar about the role of krill in the ecosystem. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself, Earl. Hi, I am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Okay. You want me to ask my question? Yes, please. Yeah, I was asking in general, I guess, about krill. Um, I don't have in front of me exactly what I typed out, but the point is that there's internationally agreed and several nations, I believe, are involved in krill harvest now. I was recently in Antarctica and um, was informed, I was surprised to see how much of the wildlife depends on krill. With climate change being so unknown, you know, does this give concern? I guess the, the fact that humans are now diving into krill harvest, it, it concerned me. 
Yeah, no, the the whole issue of harvesting of krill, especially um, in Antarctica, is a big concern. Um, the eastern part of Antarctica, the Ross Sea, has just been made a marine protected area. But what you're seeing is the fishing pressures are ending up along the peninsula, um, where a lot of the animal life um, has, you know, big breeding zones. And so that is a concern. If you look at sort of the signal over a long time, what we've seen to the north of Antarctica, just north of it, um, is that krill numbers generally have been declining. We haven't seen in Antarctica proper yet how um, a big decline in krill yet, um, but that's gonna be tied to a lot of the sea ice, um, which is an important habitat for all the larval krill before they become adults. Okay. And Oscar, you talked a little bit about, you know, the distinction between Eastern and Western Antarctica. Could you elaborate a little bit on why they're different? And uh, recently we saw an ice shelf collapse in Eastern Antarctica. So like, why is that yeah. significant? That is a, Big deal. Um, so uh, the Western Antarctic and the true Eastern Antarctica, the Totten Ice Shelf, represent areas that have a lot of that land ice that Uma talked about. Um, we've been seeing that the Western side has shown really dramatic declines and glacier retreat. Um, there is some evidence that we're starting to see it in Eastern Antarctica, um, and it's being driven by essentially the deep ocean, that circumpolar current that's warm, getting underneath the, the ice sheets. And you sort of start melting the ice sheets from below. Um, and those are the two locations where um, that circumpolar current is closest to the continent. Uh, other regions like the Weddell Sea um, and the Ross Sea are, you know, the current is farther offshore. And that's where we're not seeing uh, the decline. But the Totten Ice Shelf represents a huge proportion of the freshwater on the planet. It's frozen on the land. And while it would take a very long time, if you know you melt a lot of that, that is a huge contributor to global sea level rise. Mm -hmm. At the uh, top of the show, I also mentioned that both the Arctic and Antarctica saw heat waves in recent weeks over the past few months. And at the same time, which seems a little bit puzzling. And I'm wondering, Uma, if you can explain, you know, how unusual is this? Can you put this into context for us for what we typically see in the Arctic? And then Oscar as well, like what, what, what do you make of the timing and what do you read into this? So we, we have, we've seen an increasing number of heat waves, particularly in the winter, as well as in the summer. And I, I did find it very curious that these happened at the same time. And it's, um, I, I, I don't know if Oscar, you have more insight on it, but I, I don't have have um, a connection. I don't have a clear connection between the two. Yeah, I, I don't either. And it kind of goes back to the Arctic, you know, being surrounded by land, an ocean surrounded by land versus land surrounded by a circumpolar ocean. Um, but the size of that heat wave and the location was pretty troubling. Uh, we've got an audience question from Natalie about animal adaptation. She asks, is it possible for animals in these cold regions to adapt quickly enough to survive these massive temperature changes? I imagine that's different on the Arctic and Antarctic, but uh, Oscar, can you talk about the Antarctica? Yeah, in, in the Antarctic, um, that's the million dollar question, right? Um, and they are adapted um, you know, in several ways. They have unique physiology. Um, they show really strong seasonality. So a lot of them, like whales, will migrate down in the summertime when there's a lot of food, but migrate uh, back towards South America to breed in the summer. And what we're seeing, if you change when the sea ice is there, you change the timing of all that. And then that affects sort of how much food is available when the animals uh, need it. So if you have a penguin, an Adelie penguin, um, it needs to put four kilograms of blubber fat on its chick for that chick to survive the next winter. Um, and so if you change the timing and the krill availability, that ripples directly into the food web very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And how about in the Arctic, Uma? Um, can animals adapt to these warming? And how about the plants? So some of, some of the animals are adapting. For example, um, polar bears and walrus are spending more time on land 
but that's leading to other problems and more interactions with humans. So that's the, what's happening immediately at the long-term, you know, uh, fate is the million dollar question. Um, in terms of the marine ecosystem, there are whales, um, humpback whales and orca whales who now come much farther into the Arctic and compete with local um, local whales that, that live in the Arctic. So that again, leads to potential instability. Just a quick reminder that I'm Omer Irfan and this is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. Today, I'm talking to polar researchers Uma Bhatt and Oscar Schofield about the changing Arctic and Antarctic regions and their future under climate change. Uma, you mentioned, you know, you alluded to earlier that there are people that live in the Arctic. It's not just a ecosystem of wildlife. And they're also on the front lines of these changing landscapes. So could you tell me a little bit about how you do research with the communities there? And what have you learned from the folks that are actually seeing this firsthand? So typically, um, a, a, the Arctic's very well connected and there's a lot of communication going on. And local observers are the first front lines to tell us what's going on, what's happening with the animals, what's happening, for example, with marine debris. Um, again, all of that information is collected by local communities, and it is very important that it's communicated to governments as well as scientists in order to understand and to, you know, mitigate those problems. So I, I, marine debris is a really good example of something that there's a lot of communication from communities to local to, to researchers. Great. We've got another listener question from Nanette from Redondo Beach, California. She has a question about the data available at the polls. Nanette, if you're there, can you unmute yourself? Hi. I was wondering, with, as the ice melts, I know a lot of data you can get from the ice. Is that a lot of that data going away as the ice melts? So let me let me talk about the Arctic. Um, it, when the ice is gone, it's going to change the data that we're collecting in the Arctic. Right now, we put buoys in the Arctic to measure ice thickness and ice movement. Um, but a lot of the data that we collect is collected by ships that go out into the Arctic, and that will continue even if there isn't ice. And we use, we really rely heavily on satellites because we don't. We complain that we don't have enough data in the Arctic compared to other places, and we really rely on satellites. So. Those measurements will continue. They'll just be different once the ice is gone. Mm -hmm. And in the Antarctica, Oscar? Yeah, no, I, I we use the same techniques um, that Uma talked about. We go on ships, um, we use satellites, we live at stations in remote locations. Um, and for the ocean work now, we're increasingly using ro autonomous robots to fill in the gap when we can't have the ships there. Um, so you will lose a type of data if you lose the ice in terms of that record of what the ice had in it. Um, but, you know, compared to when I first started going to Antarctica, um, we have so many more tools now. So I'm very jealous of the graduate students these days that have remarkable uh, options I didn't. Mm -hmm. And sort of related to that, I mean, I mentioned up top that the poles are warming faster than the rest of the planet. Why is it that the coldest regions are heating up the fastest? So there's um, the, the, when, the sea ice is basically a blanket in the Arctic that keeps the, the warm ocean from transferring its heat to the atmosphere. So when that blanket goes away, the ocean warms up with, because the sun shines all summer and it amplifies that signal. So it's a positive feedback and increase, it's a, it increases the warming. So we get much more warming once we de decrease the sea ice. But we also get polar amplification from the transport from the tropics of moisture to the Arctic. So those are two key factors that lead to this amplified signal in the Arctic and, and the Antarctic. And uh, Oscar, I've seen the term the Thwaites Glacier in the news a lot. Why is that such an important piece of ice in Antarctica? And how worried should we be over the next few years, over the next couple of decades about what's going on there? Yeah, so the Thwaites Glacier is um, sort of in the Bellinghausen Sea, so it's sort of south of where I work. Um, it's a large ice sheet, and it is what we call is in runaway collapse. 
And essentially what that means is that warm, deep ocean is underneath. And so we are watching it essentially uh, collapse and increase speed by which that ice on the land is moving out into the ocean. What do we wanna be concerned about about that? Well, um, it directly impacts sea level rise because that was ice on land that is now going into the ocean and melting and can represent, um, you know, not parts of an inch of sea level rise, but inches. And if you think about a lot of our coastal cities, that has huge implications um, where humanity is going to live. The big science question that a lot of people are working on right now, there was a large expedition uh, earlier this year, is sort of what's the speed of that? You know, how's that going to happen? Is it something that happens over five, 10 years, 50 years before we see the full expression of sea level rise um, with that collapse? And it's sort of, you know, sort of a, an example of what we expect to see more of as the planet continues to warm. Mm -hmm. Now, both the Arctic and Antarctica are regions where a lot of different governments are working together and scientists a lot around the world are teaming up, but we've seen with recent current events, of course, that uh, some of that is being disrupted. The Arctic Council, which is this uh, overarching group of Arctic nations that teams up on things like working on science has been suspended since Russia invaded Ukraine. And I'm wondering, you know, with these geopolitical disruptions, how does that affect research and your know, collaboration and cooperation with other workers, other scientists around the world? I think it's been devastating for the Arctic in that people who do field work in Russia have not been able to go. Russian scientists have not been able to attend meetings. So, it, and Russia is a huge part of the Arctic physically. And it, it, it is very, uh, it, it's very much of concern to many, to all scientists in the Arctic. Yeah, I would argue the same thing for the Antarctic. Uh, the Antarctic is controlled by the Antarctic Treaty, which essentially sets aside that huge part of the planet as sort of a science preserve. You know, and so collaboration among scientists is really important in a data limited system. And you know, the realities of sort of the geopolitics is that is going to stop. And you know, you know, right now a lot of us are still trying to get out of the COVID pandemic where we haven't been able to get into the field. And this will be another thing that will slow our understanding of the systems. So now we have geopolitics and a pandemic that's sort of throwing a wrench into all this research on top of the accelerating climate change. Uh, we've got another question from an audience member, Nina from Baltimore. She has a question about carbon at the polls. Nina, if you're there, would you mind unmuting yourself and asking your question? Hi, I was wondering how are permafrost dynamics affecting the overall shift from carbon sink to carbon source in the Arctic versus the Antarctic? So uh, carbon in the, uh, as permafrost thaws, that's going to release carbon. And there's research going on about the time scale at which that's happening. And at this point, the, that that's again debated by scientists exactly when that will happen the timing of it for the antarctic um because it's been covered with ice for a long time the land we're not so much focused on the permafrost but what we are looking at as the wind speed increases on the southern ocean um you get very vigorous mixing and that has the potential to essentially decrease the amount of plankton growing um, and essentially, you know, will make the Southern Ocean less of a carbon sink. But again, like Uma was pointing out, these are really hot topics among the scientists these days. Mm -hmm. And both of you as experts in your respective fields who have been following these regions for decades, I wonder, is it hard to be a scientist to be seeing these changes happening firsthand at such a fast pace? Do you feel sort of an emotional response to the science that you're doing? And how is that shaping your thinking around this? Uma, can you answer that one first? I think you do have an emotional reaction because you're worried. And there's times that climate scientists feel hopeless, but I don't feel hopeless because of young people. Young people have really kind of helped me, the students have really helped me take a more optimistic view that we're gonna figure this out because we have a lot of the pieces in place in order to do that. I think the, the other challenge is 
I, I feel like I've never achieved total knowledge. I'm just dumb and I have to keep learning new things. And that's actually a good thing in that it's such a complex system and it, it continues to challenge me with new pieces that I need to learn about. Yeah, I guess for myself, I have the same emotional reaction. Um, my first trip down there was uh, as I was graduating as an undergraduate and the glacier behind the field station I've worked at has retreated um, almost two football fields in my professional career. And so it is sort of shocking, but my reaction is, is my mission and my job is to make sure we have the most thorough understanding of the system so we can respond to it. And I try to keep focused on that mission um, rather than, you know, getting depressed, but having kids and everything, I worry about the planet they're going to grow up on. Mm -hmm. And then finally, for both of you, looking ahead, what are some of the biggest uncertainties or unknowns that you think we need to start to resolve uh, in both the Arctic and Antarctica? Uma? I, I think the one of the uncertainties is how the different parts of the system interact with each other. You know, how the changes in the surface water impacts the atmosphere. And it's really increasing that interdisciplinary collaboration. And that's where we have a lot of knowledge we need to gain in order to understand the system. I, I would echo that. You know, the system is incredibly complex. So, you know, where I work, if the atmosphere gets moister, you get more snow and rain, which is counterintuitive. But that impacts the biology dramatically. A lot of the penguins have their eggs drowned because they're making nests in gullies to protect from the wind, not worried about water that they you know, didn't expect to have. And so there's a lot of connections that are you know, very complicated that we need to focus on. Great. That's all the time we have. I want to thank both of our guests for joining us today, Dr. Uma Bhatt, an atmospheric scientist at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and Dr. Oscar Schofield, a biological oceanographer at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Thank you both very much for joining the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us.